We welcome everyone to the last hour Berean topical discussion. And uh, we have two special guests today. We have uh, Deb Rhea from our Hi. own. Yeah, she's from our uh, last hour Berean group. And Brother Chris Milton. Hello there. Hey, guys, go on. All right. Today we're going to be talking about some specific things in regard to the Word of Faith movement. And there's one verse of scripture I, I like to I like to begin with here. It says Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And with that, Deb, I'd like to uh, to have you speak with us today about your experience and in, in history with uh, the Word of Faith movement. And I know that you're going to be speaking on this verse that I just quoted. So if you could j just just begin with uh, whatever the Lord leads on your heart. Sure, absolutely. Um, I was raised Pentecostal. So from the time that uh, I was a very young child, I attended a Pentecostal church in the Bronx. Bronx, New York, but it was nothing like what we see today. Um, my family moved up to upstate New York, and we started attending a assembly, Assemblies of God church. And even then, I'm talking about probably 35, 40 years ago, it was still very, very conservative. And... Uh, I never saw any of the antics that you see on, uh, let's say, TBN and uh, stations like that. Uh, we sang hymns. There was, uh, there was prayer. It was very holy and very respectful. However, what happened is that my mom got sick. And this is where everything changed in our lives. Uh, she came down with a incurable neurological disease and within really very shortly she was in a wheelchair and you could physically see that she was all curled up in the wheelchair so uh, to have somebody pray over her uh, it was very difficult to do um, we we left we started going actually to a tbn station that was very close to our home and uh, there, they actually asked my mom to leave because, well, <laughs> she couldn't talk. She would start making noises because she wanted somebody to pray with her and for her. And, you know, nobody would do it. Um, you know, they, these Word of Faith people, they like to pray for the headaches and the back aches and the leg lengthening and things that you can't see. But to pray for somebody that mm. has uh, an obvious physical impairment, uh, they avoid. And at that mm. time, I couldn't, I couldn't understand this at that time. Um, I just, I, I didn't, I just thought they were being cruel and maybe they were just, you know, they were just cold. And it was at the TBN station that uh, we met somebody that referred us to um, a very extreme Word of Faith church. Uh, and my dad started taking my mom there, so I went along just to make sure, you know, everything was, was okay. And I have to tell you, when I walked in, um, there were things I saw that I have never witnessed before. Even growing up in Pentecostal churches, these things just didn't happen until I would say probably about 20, 25 years ago, things started to change. Um, you know, this church didn't sing hymns. There was no hymnals. Now we had the screen where we sang Hillsong, Bethel, you know, that, that whole group of music. Um, the preaching changed. It wasn't, you would get bits and pieces of scripture you didn't even need your Bible because everything was on the screen. Um, a small chunk of scripture, and then you would hear things about how we just have the authority and God, you know, he died just to, 
it cure our self-esteem and we all should be healed and positive confessions and you know it all sounded very good you know it does appeal to our flesh i have to say um the word of faith initially appealed to my flesh when i first walked in um there were things that that bothered me and i really believe it was the holy spirit warning me but i was i was disobedient i talked to some of the pastors and you know they just said uh just don't put God in a box. And this is the next level of salvation. God is moving things in a new direction. And of wow. course, you know, who wouldn't want to be where God's moving? You know, I would want to. If God's right. moving, then I want to be there. So they put my mom right in the front row with a video camera on her every Sunday, every service. My dad took her to every service. I have to say, he was so faithful in getting her dressed learning how to do her hair and makeup because my mom took care of herself uh, and he brought her to church every week and that video camera was right on her every week uh, we had prophecies there were people that uh, traveling evangelists that came to visit and they had all these so-called words from God um, I'll tell you about one horrible experience was one man got up and said, you know, uh, my mom's name was Loretta and Loretta, the Lord really wants to heal Loretta, but there's disobedience uh, in this congregation and we need a certain amount of people to commit to fasting the whole week. And I don't remember the number if it was 20 or 30 people, um, but there was a specific number that he mentioned. And people went up to volunteer. And of course, this is my mother. So I had, to, I felt obligated to go up. And now here, I'm a single mom. I'm working at nights cleaning homes. And now I can't eat all week. And I'll tell you, that week was one of the worst in my life. Uh, but I did it because this was what the evangelist promised. And the following Sunday, we all got around my mom. They pulled her out of the wheelchair and nothing happened um so basically you know it was somebody was disobedient that has to be because god doesn't lie and this just went on for a couple of years uh, until my mom passed away and the church did not know how to handle this because they were promised this great miracle in the church and um my family was approached and basically we were told, well, there must be some great sin in your family because this was promised. It's promised in the word. And if it didn't happen, it's, it's our fault. And this really, you know, it really affected my family. I have to say, because, um, <laughs> you know, we're all sinners. Um, but to, to have somebody come to you like that and blame you and, you know, the church could have had this great testimony if it just wasn't for our family that was just, boy, we're just so lost and uh, just great hidden sin. Um, and this, this, you know, I still attended the church. I actually, after a while, I felt uncomfortable and I left the church and I went to a church in the city, New York City. and. Um, I went from bad to worse, let's put it that way, because there uh, the occult was so bad that um, I, I, I fear now just thinking of taking my kids there because everything was, I mean, the pastor just said that he can read our minds and I mean, it just went way beyond what the word says. Um, and actually when I was, sitting in this in this church all these confessions that we had to make um i realized that they they just weren't working for me you know a big thing of course was was tithing and offerings and every week the pastor asked who tithe to stand up if you tithe you stand up and he would pray an offering a pray excuse me pray a blessing over us and then if you gave an offering to stand and of course it was a better blessing because you gave above your tithe and every week i remember struggling but trying to do that because you know i wanted that blessing for my family mm -hmm. i really did and so i struggled but i i gave what the pastor said i should give 
Um, and this went on for a while. And then uh, what happened is I had a very horrible tragedy with one of my kids. And um, the first thing I thought of is, well, I'm going to call the church. And I never got a call back. I called again. And two weeks later, I still didn't get a call back. So when I went to the church, they acted like it was just my fault. And they handed me a book, a uh, secular counselor, and they referred my child to a secular counselor that uh, had things in this book about, you know, uh, gay marriage. And it had things that uh, a, a Christian would not want their child to read. Uh, and, you know, it was at that point that I realized that these people have nothing. They could sit in service and they, they claim money cometh to me now and I'm blessed and highly favored. And I would look around and I would be like, they don't have anything. They couldn't even pray. This is how bad it was, is that they couldn't even pray with me or for me. And I think it was at that point that all I can say is the bottom fell out and scales came off my eyes. And I really believe that that was the incident that the Lord used to really open my eyes. Instead of uh, admiring these uh, great pastors and these great leaders and these anointed, you know, ministers, uh, I, all of a sudden, I looked at them, and they looked dead to me. That's the only way I can describe it. They looked dead, uh, and I've never seen this before. And I realized they don't have anything that I want. Uh, I left. I left in tears, and uh, I, you know, it took me a while because I just felt so guilty of wasting so many years in something that was false. Uh, cried to the Lord, repented, and I turned off everything that I used to listen to. I mean, TBN was on my, <laughs> in my home 24 seven. There were times I kept it on at night just because the word was supposed to feed you. And uh, I turned everything off and I just opened up the word and I just let the Holy Spirit lead me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, at that point, I really thought that I was the only one that felt this way and that I was just being disobedient. But the Lord, and he is so gracious. You know, he led me to other people that were having the same experience and felt the same way. And um, it was just wonderful to have other people confirm that what, what the Lord, what I felt the Holy Spirit was leading me, uh, that what all this word of faith, everything that I was taught was a lie. And um, it's very, very hard to come out of something like this. You could hear it in my voice. I get very emotional. It's okay. <laughs> because, you know, people in this, they love the Lord. <sighs> And they just want the best. They just want to please the Lord. And this is such a cult. Um, it's such a demonic hold that these people have on their followers. And it just tears me up sometimes. Um, I repented and I know the Lord forgave me. But it's just a very, very hard thing to know that for so many years, you know, you've loved the Lord and you believe that you were doing his will and then to find out you were deceived. Um, that's hard. And I really have a compassion for people that are trapped in this. Uh, you know, they, um, they don't to, know. To, to add to, to, wow, this is powerful. Um, yes. Deb, for those of you who don't know, um, Deb is, uh, one of the administrators of the last hour Berean. She's been there with us for years, almost from day one. And I, I know her, we know her uh, personally. And let me tell you something, um, for her to say what she's saying right now, it's because she loves 
the Lord and she loves the lost. And um, when people ask the question, why do you guys go around exposing false teachers and calling out names and all of this? And you guys are so negative. Well, no, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's for people like Deb, right? Her testimony right now, I guarantee someone can relate to it when they hear it. You know, and uh, I believe the Lord is going to use her to get uh, many others out of this cult. Uh, you know, um, it's it's a miracle. Uh, you know, uh, Deb was saved. You know, and I believe there's a lot of saved people in this cult. Oh, there they, are. You know, it, mm. Because they preach, yeah, because they do they do preach a true gospel at times. But you know what they do is they corrupt that gospel with the yes. false teaching, like the yes. Galatians were admonished by Paul for doing. And, um, you know, it, you know, what, what the Holy Spirit did was to bring Deb out of it because you know why she loved the truth of God's word. She, she didn't want the lie. She wanted the truth and God, uh, used that, that very humbling experience of bringing her to the end of that delusion to, for her scale. Like she said, the scales fell off of her eyes and, and I just, I, I hope all of those who are listening right now, just listen to her words, which she says, because I know that you might feel like you're alone. You may feel isolated, like maybe it's me, maybe it's my fault, maybe I don't have enough faith, but that's not the case. That's not the case. That's what Satan wants you to believe. And as exactly. you heard from Deb right now, she, she, she was brought out by the power and love. And here's the point. You know, God didn't beat her over the head. And say, yeah. you should have known better. No, he lovingly brought her out. And look at her now. I can tell you, again, she's a wonderful sister in the Lord. And she knows the Bible. I know she would never say this about herself, but I'm going to say it. Um, she knows the Bible. She's very discerning. Okay, we need more godly women like that out there. That's just, I just want to interject that. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to plug Deb right now. <laughs> this is a book. Uh, authored by uh, myself and brother Fred Henricks from uh, The Last Arboreans, right? And it was co-edited by Ruth Weeks and none other than Deb Rea. And um, it's called The Genesis 3-5 Project, Rise of the New Gods. And you can find it on Amazon. And guess what? It's talking about what we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, yes, it does. Uh, the Word of Faith movement is a big promoter of the Genesis 3-5 lie that says, ye shall be as gods. As gods, yes. And it started right in Genesis. That lie started right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Satan got a hold of Eve, and, you know, it, it, what he told her sounded good. <laughs> sounded sure did, good. Didn't it? <laughs> no, you, be, you will be as God. And God doesn't want you to eat this fruit because, you know, he just doesn't want you to be like him. Um, and you, she took, she took the bait just like many of us still do. Uh, you know, uh, we all, like I said before, this cult is, it's, uh, it's self focused. It's focused on man. It's not focused on God at all. They don't preach about God or Jesus. Now they do speak of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the spirit that they're speaking of is not part of the Trinity. I can tell you that um, some of the uh, worst ones that have merged into the NAR, they don't even say Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. They say Holy Spirit. Yeah, and I've heard that. That's the, yeah, that's the clue. That right there is the like Heidi Baker thing. in those, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. But that is the same way that the Wiccans and the New Agers and the witches, they all say spirit, Holy Spirit. They all are accessing that same spirit. And if it sounds judgmental to you uh, that I'm saying that, uh, you really need to, to listen to what they're saying. They Amen. are not praising God. They're not uh, the Holy Spirit's focus should be on Jesus, and it's not. Amen. It's Amen. all on, this is all on us, and it's man-focused and what we are. And I'll tell you, some of the scriptures that they twist is, is just mind-boggling. Uh, when you go into the Word and you start reading whole chapters, you could, all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. 
that's not what that scripture is saying. It's saying just the opposite. But they well, give speaking you, speaking of scriptures, Deb, like, you know, like yeah. Brother Bill opened up with uh, Hebrews eleven. Uh, uh, let's, yeah. let, 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 let's, yeah. let's talk about that scripture because oh. you know that's one that's a big one, isn't it, Deb? That is, you know what? That is one of their favorite scriptures, and this is one of the scriptures that they they go to the King James version for because they like the way it's written that faith is a substance. Now they take that word substance and they say it's a physical force that we can actually manipulate through our words. Our words are containers for power and they, they can manipulate this force to get whatever we want. And God has to do what we say. This is this is just it's just blasphemy. I don't know any other word to say, but to say that God has to abide by our words um, because uh, we have authority now. God doesn't you know, have. I, I tell you, I tell you what. I, I did a, a video a couple of years back, and you guys know about this video where it had Benny Hinn and uh, the late Miles Monroe. I guess oh. they were the Bahamas, and they were talking about what Deb just said. Um, you know that. God can do nothing without a man's permission. Yes. You know, that he is illegal on planet Earth, that he needs a man or a woman to give him license or permission to work in the world. And I'm thinking yep. to myself, then who authorized God to send the flood? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah. they didn't think this thing through. And, and, and sadly, uh, Miles Monroe died a few years back in a horrible yes. plane crash. And, and I believe he knows the truth now in the era of his ways. But that's a that's a very prominent teaching in the Word of Faith movement, isn't it, Bill? It's yeah. very prominent. Yeah. Even when we pray, uh, their definition of prayer is not what our definition is. Uh, their definition is giving God permission or license to interfere in our lives. Can you imagine wow. that? That wow. that is, and that's that's a teaching that Benny Hen and Miles Monroe taught. That that is their definition of prayer. That we actually give God permission to hmm. interfere in our lives. And I mean, that is, I even hate saying that. It just, it, yeah, it's it's just horrible to think about. Um, they claim God can do nothing without a human giving him access. Uh, you know, they obviously have not read Job. They haven't read any of the Old Testament. I mean, look what God did with Israel, the judgment that he brought on them when they sinned. Um, God has authority over everything, angels, demons. He has authority over it all. Uh, and we're his children. Yes. Amen. And he wants us to ask him. That's another thing with word of faith. You never ask God for anything. You just no, you, you claim. demand. And you tell you God demand. what to do. That's what you, they believe, right? Yes. You tell you God what to do. Uh, you make demands on God, and He has to obey His because it's uh, His mm. laws. They have these things called spiritual laws that I really don't find in the Word when I look, but they take, like I said, little chunks of Scripture. Like when Adam was created, he, God created Adam in his image. Well, they take that and say that Adam was actually a carbon copy of God. And Kenneth Copeland, Jesse, yeah, he teaches yeah. that. Oh, Kenneth Copeland says that, and Jesse Duplantis takes Ooh, it gods. further than that and says that God made, when he made these animals, they were just formed out of, out of the dirt, and he had to carry them to Adam and ask him what they were. Yeah, that Adam, was actually Jesse Duplantis. I remember yes, that teaching Duplantis. very clearly. Yeah. And, and God Speaking said to spirit. Adam, speak, spirit. And I, whatever Adam called them, they became, and they became alive. So Adam wow. was actually the one that created everything. Uh, <laughs> and uh -huh. Adam, no, I tell you what, I've heard, I've heard, uh, what's his name, um, Preflo Dollar yes. say that the, the, uh, unfinished planets in the solar system was actually Adam practicing to create. God was actually training Adam to create. But my thing is, if you are a carbon copy of God, if you are God, why do you need training? God is perfect. A perfect yes. person doesn't need to learn anything because they are perfect. So right. the fact that Adam had to 
practice creating. And like Benny Hinn said, he flew to the moon, but that's he another thing. He flew to other planets. You know? <laughs> you know, and then Adam had to learn creation. Like, listen. <laughs> yes. And then you got people like Andrew Womack. He's one of the most dangerous ones. He's awesome. He has, a, he has a teaching out there that says that it was man and the prophets of old that spoke Jesus into existence. Can you, can you oh, believe that? Yes, yes, I heard him say that. I heard him say that. And we have all authority, God. He, actually, God can't do anything for us unless we release it. We speak these words. They have this, this teaching that words are containers of power. Um, they take verses like life and death are in the power of the tongue. They hmm. take that and twist it where we can speak speak things. You know, when God created the universe, he spoke it into existence. Um, Hebrews 11.3, they totally twist that, where um, it says, you know, it says by faith, God created the world. They twist it and says, God used faith in his words to create the world. Yeah. They said everything, something like, um, that we understand but that it was by faith. They say the God we understand kind of that it was by faith, yeah, that God used faith somehow, that yes. faith is a higher law than even God. Mm. And yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. It says, but it actually says it's by faith we understand. It, right. it has nothing to do with God doesn't right. need faith for anything. God doesn't need faith. No, <laughs> no. But everything gets twisted. You yeah. know, to, that we have we have the power because you know, uh, Adam lost that authority when he sinned. But Christ got it back for us. Now, what I find very strange is they don't teach, you know, supposedly we're little gods, but they don't teach that Jesus on earth was God. They teach yeah. that everything he did was as a man, only as a man. Yeah. And like when he spoke to the storms in Mark, uh, we can do the same thing, which is why Gloria Copeland mm -hmm. says, you control the weather. Uh, you know, they, but yet they stay home in bad weather. You know, people don't, <laughs> people don't see this. Um, I just, I think I, I was just listening to a tape where Ken Copeland says, that, you know, they had a meeting and they were rained out for three days. And I wanted to say, well, why didn't you just command the weather? You said you can. Mm. What they are teaching, they don't do, they can't do themselves. When they get sick, they go to the doctor. That's right. That's uh, right. You know, uh, of course we're supposed to get prayer, but these people, they get, they go to the doctor, they take medicine, they wear glasses. Um, uh, you know, you see them with, if they break their arms, they have a cast. Yeah, they're human. You know, I, I tell you what, I would, you know, that whole teaching that Adam was God, I would love to ask Kenneth Copeland or, or any of these Word of Faith leaders, then how did Adam succumb to temptation and sin? Because God is not tempted with evil, nor does he tempt man with evil. It's exactly. impossible for God to sin. This is why Jesus Christ overcame that temptation in the wilderness. It, was, it wasn't even a contest. You know, no. he's not tempted by anyone or anything to do evil. Right? So how did, in the world did God sin in the garden? If Adam is God like they teach, and he succumbed to Satan, that means Satan is more powerful than God, isn't it? Well, they claim that Satan has authority, had authority before Christ, you know, died and rose again. But they always have answers. Um, you know, even Stephen Furtick says, you know, God broke the law. Uh, you know, they claim that God can sin. and um, I believe I heard a teaching where, you know, Adam was, Eve was the one that was tempted and she was the one that really sinned. Adam was just, you know, he loved Eve and he just went along with her. They have an answer for everything. Right. Uh, mm. It's not biblical, but these are the answers that they, they give. Uh, they, they make up things as they go along because they have. I mean, listen, Adam, they, Adam might have went along with Eve, but he still sinned. He, he still sinned. Fact, as a matter of fact, he was the he was the main one that sinned. Absolutely, he, he was the one in authority in that. And then you notice yes. they didn't realize they were naked until Adam. Adam said, "Right, fruit. right." You know, exactly. All could exactly. all could have still been forgiven and preserved if Adam would have corrected his wife, but he didn't. He, he went did. ahead and went along with it. So yeah, not just Eve. Adam sinned as well. As a matter of fact, he was the primary 
uh, center in that whole thing because he was in charge in that garden. He was garden. responsible, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what it says in Romans, that the it, it speaks the, of the fact that Adam is the one who sinned. It didn't mention Eve. Exactly. In that, in that passage. Exactly. Hey, I wanted right, to go back. It was through Adam that brought death into the world. That's yeah. the one. That's it. Hey, I wanted to go back to the uh, this, the discussion about how the word of faith believe that they can pretty much tell God what to do. Mm-hmm. There's a passage of scripture here in Psalm 12, verses 1 through 7. I'd like to read this, and then we can talk about it. Psalm 12, 1 through 7. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Mm-hmm. Who have said with our tongue, will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. What, uh, what, do, you, what do you get from that uh, passage of Scripture? Yeah. Oh, um, I tell you what, uh, <laughs> this, this uh, verse actually, years ago as I was studying, this jumped out at me, and it's like the entire Word of Faith package right there in, in this verse. I mean, you could start from um, verse 2. It says, they speak vanity. Everyone was his neighbor. These people are arrogant. They're vain. They're prideful. You know, in some cases, I, I believe it was Creflo Dollar, uh, it, it said in one of his programs that he doesn't want to even see old cars parked in front of this church. And they got to park that in the back or something. They're vain. If you look at TBN, like Deb was bringing up TBN, and I tell you, I used to watch TBN a lot, and now I watch it to see who I'm going to expose next, you know, but <laughs> they, 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 have, they have the throne. They're sitting on thrones, man, made of real gold, and they are, you know, like I'm a king's kid. They talk like this. They're very vain, you know, and then it says here in verse um, uh, three, it says, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips. They're flatterers, right? And the tongue that speaketh proud things. Again, think of TBN, Paul and Jan Crouch, Stephen Furtick, uh, Paula White, Joyce Meyer, Beth Moore, all of them. They're very proud. And then it says this, and here's the kicker in verse 4 that I want people to tune in on. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Because they think themselves little gods. They do. If you're a God, who could be God over you, you know? And they trust in their lips and their tongue, as Deb was saying, they're speaking. Like Jesse Duplantis said, they're speaking spirits. We have the power to create and speak for things into existence. And I'm telling you, God doesn't uh, put verses in in his word just randomly and for no, no reason. He is the God that is outside of time and beyond time and space, and he sees the future as one big now. So he knew what was coming along. He knew that the cults that would be coming along, and he warned us way back here in Psalm 12. You know, and matter of fact, it goes on in that very same Psalm to say that they oppress the poor. Now, how do they oppress the poor? Absolutely. They're prosperity mm-hmm. creatures. Mm-hmm. And they're you know? stealing. They're stealing, they're stealing. God's people. Yes. And as, De- and as Deb, felt, Deb said earlier, she said that she felt obligated, like, you know, if she doesn't give her tithe or her offering, she feels like she's not doing her part as a Christian and disappointing God. They're robbing. They're oppressing yeah. the poor. You know, right, Deb? They're not only robbing, but they are, uh, they threaten people, too. Uh, they threaten your family. Uh, your kids are going to hell. Um, wow. You know, you have to give not just tithe, but you have to give over an abundance of that. You have to give your all. Let's put it that way. And they say that, you know, when uh, God gave everything he had, he gave his son. Uh, So we are 
to be just like God because we're little gods, so we have to imitate God. And that's what God did, and that's what we're supposed to do. Um, I, you know, I believe it's Rod Parsley, whose son, uh, don't know if he had autism, but Rod Parsley claims that he emptied out all his bank accounts, and he had to do that in order for God to heal his son. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and I, I believe that there are times these people do get healed, but it's not of God, because God doesn't, that's not the way God works. God doesn't get the glory for these healings. Uh, and for whatever uh, signs and wonders, it's if you really think about it, man is getting the glory because man right. spoke it. And it's not God that did it. It's man. It's man's words that did it. Um, and God doesn't work that way. He, he All glory goes to him. <laughs> so uh, that psalm is really, it's frightening. Because these people are going to stand before God one day and answer for mm -hmm. every word that comes out of their mouth. Right. Every word. We'll be, hit, and we'll, be right. we'll be judged for every idle word that we speak. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You know, going back to that verse, Hebrews 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, we referred to earlier, and uh, Deb, you brought up the fact how that uh, these people claim that Faith is a tangible force that is yeah. direct, directed by the words they speak. You know, the, that word, that word substance, you know, there are other, other words in Scripture that, that are used for that particular word. Uh, confidence. The word exactly. is confidence. And then in Hebrews 1 verse 3, it, is, it says, Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That, right. that term, express image of his person, is that exact word. In other words, that substance or that confidence is all directed toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Exactly. It's, it's but that's confident. why they, yes, and that's why they rely on the King James Version for that verse, because mm -hmm. they love that word substance. Every other version uh, uses different words. Um, and it just doesn't fit what their, what 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 they want to teach. Yeah, with their agenda. Um, yes, it right. doesn't go with their agenda. They use another w thing that Word of Faith does is they use multiple translations. They mm -hmm. get a thought and they know what they want to teach, and then they look at all the different translations and they try and find, pick and choose what they want to say from the word so they twist the word to say what they wanted to say um right. and i noticed that uh, you know sometimes when like paula white and uh ken copeland they will always mention about greek scholars and but they never mention who uh -huh. you know they yeah. mention these you know these we, these Greek scholars uh, that would that agree with them, <laughs> but you know, I've never heard a name mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I never heard where they actually went into the Greek to yeah. give us the root of the words. They just say things, and people just accept it because you know they're called. That's, that's right. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. What's funny is they always, you know, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They always use that as saying. You'll see the evidence of these unseen things when you speak it into existence. Right. And, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, if you read the context of it, listen, you, all the things, basically everything, the evidence of the things that are coming can be seen by the things that already were prophesied and are fulfilled. Like if right. God kept those past prophecies and you see them come to pass, the things that you're hoping for in the future, that those same promises, the rapture, you know, the eternity, millennium, all of that, mm -hmm. you don't see them yet, but the evidence is there because you know God's past promises came to pass. So basically, you can see it because you know God can't lie, number one. <laughs> you, you know, you know exactly. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and what did Jesus say? He did. You know, Abraham wasn't alive in Jesus' day, but Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he did. It's the same kind of thing. It doesn't mean Abraham spoke mm -hmm. anything into existence. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> hey, guys, we got less than five minutes. I wanted to just close, and uh, I wanted to quote again uh, Psalm 12, verses 6 through 7, and the importance of the word of God, not man's words. 
The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's the word of the Lord, not our words. Now, in closing, uh, Deb, did you, did you have, have any uh, final last words for us today? Well, I, a lot of people will say, why do you even bother doing this? Um, we'll just let them teach what they want and, you know, let's all just get along. But they don't understand how serious this is and how many people think that they're saved. And they're going to stand before God. And God is going to say, I never knew you. I don't want to see that happen. None of us here want to see that happen. So first, you know, examine yourself and see if you really are in the faith. And if you are, you, this should really shake you. And you should really want to know, hey, am I being deceived? Is this a lie? Why would you want to follow a God that has no authority and can't do anything on your part? My God, I can rest and know that whatever happens, my God's got me in the palm of his hand and nothing could take me out of his will. Nothing. Wouldn't you want to know that God instead of the God of the word of faith, which is really Satan. That is really Satan. These people are leading you astray. They're not leaving you, leading you to the God of the Bible. And you really, you owe it to yourself. This isn't just a competition about, you know, who we, who we like and who we don't like. This isn't like American Idol where, you know, I like this one and you like that one. This is serious. This is your eternal destiny. You know, if you're not saved, you better open up the word and really seek God. If you walked an aisle and said the sinner's prayer and because you wanted something from God, you better go over that and, and, and really see if you're truly saved. And if you are, the devil can't take you can't steal your salvation, but he can rob your ministry, he can rob your testimony, and he can rob your eternal blessings if you allow him. So this is not a minor issue. This is serious. And I really, I plead with those in this word of faith to just listen to what we're saying. Turn off everything, the TV, uh, and just spend time in the word with the Holy Spirit. And he will, he promises to lead us and guide us into all truth. And he will. Amen. 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 Well, with that, I just want to say uh, thanks to both of you for uh, being on the program today. Uh, very insightful. And uh, I know that the Lord will, will use these, these words uh, to help others. And so, uh, again, with that, I just want to say, Goodbye for now. And Brother Chris, I'd like to give you the final word. If we don't see you here, we'll see you in the air. God bless. God bless you all. Maranatha. Maranatha.